Virtual worlds. They can seem to be just networked computer games or cooperative quests involving hundreds or thousands of participants. But virtual worlds are starting to take the form of online societies, making them ripe for social scientists doing research. The way scientists are using virtual worlds is the subject of a news feature in a special section on social cognition in the September 7, 2007 issue of Science. So for the first time ever, we have a technology, a media that not only shows someone what they're doing, but actually captures all the specific details about all the nuances of our movements. That it allows for the first time an unprecedented uh, approach to the study of virtual worlds and to the study of social action, interaction, and transaction that cuts across many of the disciplinary barriers that have been in place in prior research. When you do experiments in virtual reality, they're essentially, in principle, infinitely repeatable under, under the same conditions. Each of these scientists use virtual worlds and the related technology to conduct their research, recognizing that, as with every new technology, there are opportunities and challenges. For example, MMOs, or massively multiplayer online games, generate a lot of data, but making sense of all of it takes a lot of computer power. For about 12 uh, months of data that we have collected from one of these MMOs, EverQuest, uh, which is uh, EverQuest 2 made by Sony, the amount of data that we got from them for, from three servers was about four terabytes of data. Uh, that may not be a lot by the standards of some of the hard sciences, but in social science, that's a phenomenal amount of data. And in order to manipulate that data, to be able to make it meaningful data on social action, social interaction, and social transactions, uh, you need at least another six times that amount of space. So we're dealing with uh, 24 terabytes of manipulation space in order to analyze this data. The reason for such large amounts of data is because every movement is captured, whether keystrokes on a keyboard or, in some cases, movements of your head and body. The difference with a virtual media is that there's a cycle of tracking and rendering. So in order for me to show you my avatar, I have to send you all the very small details about how my avatar moves so you can then draw it on your computer. Uh, the difference between that and a video conference is that all the specific details and all the very, very fine-grained specifics of the movement are represented in a, a non-abstract way so that you can then know everything that I'm doing. By combining that knowledge with the ability to create computer-generated virtual environments, researchers gain more control over their experiments. Our evidence suggests that people tend to behave in the virtual world similar to how they will behave in a similar situation in the real world. If you're doing experiments in a virtual environment, of course, you control the lighting, you control the degree of sound, and all of those uh, in essentially external parameters are under your control. That control enables researchers to conduct experiments that, in the real world, would be unethical, such as giving electric shocks to virtual people. The visual appearance and the behavior and the sounds of the virtual character actually has an effect on the behavior of the subjects. Rationally, it doesn't make any sense. Everybody knows there's nobody there, there's nobody getting any shocks, there's nobody complaining. Nevertheless, people responded as if it was a real person. They delayed giving the shocks because it was unpleasant to do so, especially the responses of the virtual character were unpleasant after they'd received the shock. <laughs> I'm not answering anymore. And as with every technology, opportunities exist for people to use it irresponsibly, too. Yes, uh, the potential for misuse here is tremendous. We've run experiments specifically with uh, political influence and shown that people are more likely to vote for politicians who copy uh, aspects of their identity. Nevertheless, knowing what is possible with this technology can prevent its misuse, including learning how to detect when others are using technology to influence you. Of course, this technology also allows you to influence others and misrepresent yourself, a characteristic that provides yet another research path for scientists studying virtual worlds. If people are acting in a certain way in a virtual world, then that doesn't become a bug for this approach. It becomes a feature because we are interested in seeing how people may engage in deception, how people may engage 
uh, in, a, in a behavior that is different in a virtual world than they would do in a real world, exactly because our world is increasingly merged between that real and the virtual world. Read more about these and other scientists studying social cognition in humans, apes, and avatars in the September 7th issue of Science. Science is published by AAAS, the Science Society.